Good morning. It is good to see everybody here today. Thank you for coming. Uh, pray with me, if you would, please. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. So I'm in this world for 52 years. Thank you, Lord. And I got to say, though, there are things taking place in this world, in this country, and unfortunately sometimes in our churches that I never thought I would live to see. There are things going on that shout that we need not just a little bit of Jesus. We need a lot of Jesus and we need Him quick. How many times have we read or heard the Sermon on the Mount? As we all know, this is the introduction of Jesus' ministry. From a showstopper point of view, it is the most incredible opening act of all times. Jesus said things on that day that shook the very nature of this world. Even today, we can't get our hands around many of the things He said. Even today, after reading the sermon over and over and over again, we sometimes find ourselves muttering under our breath, he really said that. Surely, surely he meant something else. But as we lie awake in our beds at night, pondering the notion, all we're left with is a quiet voice that confirms, yep, he really said that. He really meant that. And as we explore the sermon, know this, that without the cross, the sermon is just a fine speech. But because of the cross, that sermon is alive. It was alive back then. It was alive today. And it's going to remain alive for all eternity. Listen to what he said, some of the things he said. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Jesus continues saying things such as believers being the light of the world. He said that he did not come to destroy the law or the prophets. He told of how murder begins in the heart, about marriage, about oaths, and that an eye for an eye is out, and how we are to love our enemies. He said things that people of his day weren't accustomed to hearing. They lived in times of oppression. Their ancestors from times of many, many wars. You have to believe after hearing his sermon, they went home and they said, how can this, how can this be? Now before I go on, I want to lay a foundation that is critical to understanding why Jesus was able to say some of the things he said. You have to be able to understand and believe John 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus was talk, John was talking about Jesus being God. Now, I'm not going to get into a deep discussion on the Trinity, but it is critical to understand the Trinity, in my opinion, in my opinion, part of the problem with today's modern Christian church is we have either forgotten or for the sake of political correctness, we have set aside the truth as to who Jesus actually was. Jesus was God in the flesh. Part of who we are is contained in our DNA. The other parts are our upbringings, our teachings, our experiences, our beliefs. Every one of us, same thing. But in Jesus' case, all his words, all his actions proved that he was God incarnate. Later in John 8, Jesus himself declares, hear this, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus has been there from the beginning. Jesus and the Spirit were there in the Garden of Eden. They were there with Abraham, there with Noah, there with Moses, there with Joshua, 
there with David, there with Solomon, there in the times when Israel and Judah were divided, there during the Babylonian exile, there with all the prophets who faithfully and obediently served the Lord. Jesus and the Spirit was there from the beginning. Unbeknownst to the people of Jesus' day, that day on the mount, they were actually getting to hear the words of God. And today, any time we open this book, we're actually getting to see the words of God. It's as real now as it was then. So specifically, I'd like to draw your attention to a portion of Jesus' sermon that's commanded us to love our enemies. It's in Matthew 5, verses 43 through 48. Read with me now the word of God. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet your brethren only... What do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father is perfect in heaven. Now, there is so much in play in those passages, both for the people in Jesus' day and the people for today. It was one thing for Jesus to say, you shall love your neighbor. We've all been in Sunday school classes where we get in that bait. Okay, what's the definition of a neighbor? Who's my neighbor? My neighborhood? Is he my neighbor? He... We get into that debate. But when Jesus said, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, that completely causes us to run the car, right? Slap into the ditch. It's hard for us to get that in our head. Now remember, enemies, enemies throughout time were to be hated. They were to be despised warred against, to make battle against at a moment's notice. Plans and designs were drawn up completely at the ready to be implemented at the drop of a hat. Conflicts were considered inevitable, and the mere possibility of being defeated was unacceptable. Whether today or two to three thousand years ago, the enemies we have and the enemies we prepare for, we have a distinct history with them. We have a history that we played a role in whether we want to admit it or not. And knowing how difficult sometimes it is for many folks to, to admit, we, we, we won't recognize sometimes how the enemy became an enemy or why sometimes he even is an enemy. Satan oftentimes uses that for his benefit. He always wants to keep us in a constant state of the, of the Hatfields and the McCoys. Or maybe a better example would be the Carters and the Wakefields. Who's ever heard of the Carters and the Wakefields? Season one, Andy Griffith show. <laughs> Guy and this girl come to Sheriff Taylor's house in the middle of the night wanting to get married. But before the marriage can take place, the fathers of the two burst in at gunpoint, pulling the old, ain't one of them, and getting a hitch to one of us. The entire episode is spent watching Andy try to figure out how to settle an 87-year-old feud, which nobody has died in, and nobody can describe how it even started. Why are you feuding, Andy says? Because he's a carter. Well, why are you feuding? Because he's a Wakefield. One of, the, one of the scenes in the, in, the, in the show, Sheriff Taylor goes to the guy's house and he's sitting on his front porch shooting blindly into the woods. Sheriff says, what you shooting at? I thought I saw a Wakefield. No idea what he was shooting at. Scared to death, both of them were of each other. But there was some hating going on. Sadly, though, many of our enemy situations aren't so comical. Some of our enemy situations can be quite hurtful, they can be stressful, and they can cause great anger. And sometimes they can be quite dangerous if allowed to fester. 
So can we love our enemies? If Jesus tells us to, you better believe it can be done. There is nothing that we are commanded to do that our Lord has not already confirmed a way in how to do it. And as we said earlier, if Jesus said it, he meant it. And if he said it, then it can be done, and the result will be as we are promised. We just, we just have to believe. Because you see, that's a basic example of the faith we are supposed to have. We can read lengthy examples of, of, of faith throughout the Bible and throughout time, and through true faith, it is shown to reap rewards because true faith pleases God. So, where, where am I going with this? I'm going to one verse that I believe encapsulates the premise and the pathway for what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount when referring to enemies. I'm going to one verse that Jesus understood because Jesus was there, because he was God in the flesh. And as we said earlier, Jesus and the Spirit were there in the garden. They were there with Abraham, there with Moses, there with Noah, there with Joshua, there with David, there with Solomon, there during the times when Israel and Judah were in conflict. There with all the true servants. Jesus saw throughout the ages what the ages of the future needed to understand. And that was Proverbs, verse 16 and verse 7. When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. So what is this way to please the Lord? Well, Hebrews 11.6 declares, But without faith it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is God, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Previously in Hebrews 11, we know that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So you see, faith is not wishful thinking or trying to believe in something that you know isn't true. Pastor Charles Stanley writes, Faith proclaims our weakness while also proclaiming the trustworthiness of God and His complete and willing ability to do what we cannot do. A lack of faith insults God because it puts foolish confidence in ourselves. Folks, faith is the conviction that God will always do what He promises to do without regard to the circumstances. And being faithful to God means obeying His commands. Yes, faith requires obedience. Back in Hebrews 6, we read that the rewards of faith are for those that diligently seek Him. I can assure you, diligence and obedience have a lot of similarities from an operational point of view in our life. When God commands us to obey, He has given us a principle by which to live. He's also setting up a framework around our lives that forms a hedge of protection from evil. Disobedience always has fierce repercussions. Don't kid yourself. The Lord has always known the devastating effect that obedience has on our lives. He's seen it in this world since the Garden of Eden. If we obey Him, He will pull us closer to Himself and teach us more about His love. And lastly, but certainly not least, love. Church, you will not obey the Lord if you don't love Him. You won't. In Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments section, everybody knows the abbreviated version, right? You shall have the no gods before me, and you shall not make for yourself a, garden imi a carved image. But look what you miss if you just stop right there. It goes on, it says, Any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth, you shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing mercy to those who love me and keep my commands. Yeah, Brother Randy, but we're new covenant folk. You're talking about that old covenant stuff. Yep, that's right, I am. But, but, but look at John 14, verses 15 and 21. These are Jesus' words. If you love me, 
keep my commandments. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. You see what just happened there? Why would Jesus say that? Because he knows it to be true. He was there. Jesus and the Spirit were there in the garden. There with Abraham. There with Noah. There with Moses. There with Joshua. There with David. There with Solomon. There during the times when Israel and Judah were in division. There during the Babylonian exile. There with all the prophets. There with all the true servants. Before Abraham, Jesus said, I am. Jesus has always known what faith is. Jesus has always known what obedience is. Jesus has always known what love is. He's always known it. And Jesus meant exactly what he said when he said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. 2 John 1 and verse 6 further declares, and this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. But we find so much difficulty in obedience and, and, and keeping commands. Why? Maybe it's because we're trying to do it in our own strength and understanding. We try to put us and our brain first instead of God and our faith in Him first. In John 1, 5 and 34, we read, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. But whatever is born of God overcomes the world. Only when we try to obey God through our own power do His commandments feel burdensome. When we try to do it ourselves, it feels like a load. Give it to Him. When we rely on the power of the Holy Spirit that lives within us, that enables us to do what we can't in and of ourselves, then obedience doesn't feel burdensome. We can overcome the temptations of this world. Now, how, how important is it to overcome? I'll show you back to the book of Revelations, chapters 2 and 3. Describes the seven churches. The unfaithful church, the dead church, the persecuted church, the compromising church, the lukewarm church, the loveless church, and the corrupt church. With each church, God reminds each one that if it overcomes, it would specifically be able to sit with God at the throne, to make them a pillar in the temple of God, that they would be clothed in white garments, that they would be given the power over all nations, that they would be given hidden manna to eat, that they shall not be hurt by the second death, that they would be allowed to eat from the tree of life. You're wrong if you don't think. You're wrong if you think overcoming isn't important to God because it is. So I say to you this morning that faith, like love, cannot be separated from obedience. Now, for all of you, that may, some of you might be thinking, wait a minute, the sermon is about enemies. We're all over this faith stuff, this obedience stuff. When we're going to get back to the, to, to the enemy stuff, we never left. We've been talking about it all morning long. We never left. You see, we started talking about enemies. We read what Jesus said about the enemies. We talked about feuding enemies of this world, both real and imagined. We discovered what Proverbs says, what the Lord will do with our enemies. And now we're handling the concept of defeating the enemies in the power and presence of the great I Am, the creator of the universe who always was and always will be. But before we get in that enemy whooping mode, let me run something by you. I haven't been to seminary. I'm not some theologian. But the more I look, the more I believe the Lord never intended for us to have enemies. Can't make me think that. I can't find it in here. In the Old Covenant, they were always told to love your Lord with all of your heart and soul and to love your neighbor as yourself. And in the New Covenant, Jesus confirmed the same thing. And I think we clarified earlier that the Lord meant everything He said. 
Every word. Not optional. And more importantly, He expected us to abide in His Word. So what happened? Seems like we're still shooting blindly off the front porch, huh? As the sheriff's trying to figure out what we're shooting at. At some point in our lives, we have to admit that we played a critical role in the making of our enemies. Because if for one minute this thought, this notion is correct and the Lord never intended for us to have enemies, then who let them in? Yeah, I have a problem with that one myself. It's real easy for me to say, I didn't do nothing wrong. Well, was it because maybe I didn't necessarily do anything wrong? Or was it because I didn't do what was right? What's right for God? What pleases God? What pleases a God that was always there and always will be? What pleases the Lord that says, I will never leave you nor forsake you? What pleases the Lord that gave us, in His words, the Helper in the form of the Holy Spirit that will be with you always and that will manifest Himself in you? When the Holy Spirit manifests Himself in you, can you imagine the protection Maybe then we can understand truly what the Scripture passes that says, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. What pleases the Lord? The answer is faith, love, and obedience. And we've already talked about how they are connected. And in understanding that connectivity, we are left with only one unquestionable truth. When a man's ways pleases the Lord. He maketh even His enemies to be at peace with Him. Sounds crazy, doesn't it? No. Nah. One of the numerous established principles of God's law is that you will find throughout the Bible is of the seed, time, and harvest principle. The reaping and the sowing. The reality of reaping and sowing is applicable for obedience and it's applicable for disobedience. It's applicable for faith, and it's applicable for unfaithfulness. And most importantly, it's applicable for when you love, and it's applicable for when you don't love. Scripturally speaking, there is a very, very real possibility that reaping and sowing played a part with whatever enemies you may or may not have in your life. Sounds crazy. No. No. In John 15 and 5, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. You know what this tells me? If we find ourselves with enemies, then without the Lord, they're going to remain our enemies. Sounds crazy. Today, the often repeated catchphrase you hear about gun control is that we don't have a gun control problem, we have a heart problem. As a Christian, I would say, and take it one step further, we don't have a gun problem. The problem is the number of lives without Jesus in them. As a, I can't see it any other way because if Jesus was truly in more lives in this country, we wouldn't have as much violence in this country. Because if Jesus was truly in more lives in this country, we wouldn't have as much hate Blame, envy, greed, murder. With Jesus in more lives in this country, there'd more be more unity and harmony. There'd be more caring of our brother's burdens. There'd be more conviction, forgiveness, repentance. If there was more pleasing of Jesus in our lives, we'd feel more conviction in our hearts when we even remotely, remotely hurt our brother. And it would bring our hearts to tears and it would stop us in our tracks and move us to an immediate repentance to turn away from those actions. Instead, we've become a society of it's not my fault. I'm the victim. I'm offended here. Therefore, whatever I have to do to make myself feel better, I'm justified. Sounds crazy. Our God tells us to love Him with all of our heart and soul and mind and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Our God, the singular one that proclaimed before Abraham, I am, 
that was, is, and forever will be tells us if we love him, we'll keep his commands and obey him and that he'll dwell within us and manifest himself in our daily lives. Our God says that in faith, faith that can be as small as a mustard seed. With that faith that we will diligently seek him more and more and more and more. And we shall be rewarded. Believe that. You will be rewarded. Believe it. Sounds crazy though, doesn't it? When a man's ways pleases the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. Oh God, I want that. I want to know that as strong as I'm sitting here. Can we know it? Yeah, we can. Look, every, I mean, let me put it this way. Every night we go to bed not knowing if tomorrow will come. Yet every night we say our prayers with confidence. If I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. And off to sleep we go, peaceful, confident, knowing that we're safe. Because we know the resurrection was real and that in our faith, we know that on our last breath here, we will be standing next to God forever and forever and forever. That's not crazy. And if we know that, if we know that, then there is absolutely no reason at all why we can't know with equal certainty that when a man's ways pleases the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. Now this world, I'm not trying to say anything. This, this world is always going to have light being attacked by darkness. I'm not, I'm not telling you otherwise, but before today, things took place that we were involved in that may be causing consequences that now we must finish, finish them through. Consequences that may have created an enemy. But it doesn't mean from this day forward that you can't have a new thought process. Place your focus on the Lord. Place your focus on the cross. Not, not on your enemies. Have the faith to know that He is the great I Am. Love Him with all, your, all of your heart, without reservation. Saturate your mind in His Word. Give your heart and your best effort to obey Him. You're not going to get it right every time, but He's going to see the sincerity in your heart. And the, sincerity, and the fact that sincerity is there, I'll tell you, first and foremost, sincerity and love go hand in hand. We can't do this on our own. Or with just a little bit of Jesus involved in the process. Folks, this country's not going to survive without just a li- with just a little bit of Jesus. We need a lot of Jesus That same Jesus that said before Abraham was, I am. Know what that means. Because many within the modern Christian church have forgotten that. As evidence in the crazy things we presently debate. Restructure your way of thinking as per God's word. Renew your mind. And then have the faith, the love, and the obedience of heart to know how he will handle the enemies of the light. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.